Hello, and thank you for joining us for part three of our series, Biodiversity Applications for Airborne Imaging Systems. My name is Brittany Beaudry, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Juan Torres Perez, Sativa Cruz, Amber McCullum, and our guest speakers for today, Atticus Stavall and Phil Townsend. For this training, we have four sessions, each being one and a half hours long. We started last Monday on March 27th. Today, April 3rd, is our third session, and our fourth and final session is this Wednesday, April 5th. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here, and you can also email myself or my colleagues at the email addresses shown here for any questions. There are two prerequisites for this training an understanding of the basics of remote sensing and hyperspectral data for land and coastal systems. We have our courses on those concepts listed here. For this series, we will have one homework assignment. The link to the homework will be made available during our last session and will be due on Wednesday, April 19th. The homework will be a Google form that you submit online. And if you attend all the sessions and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of completion. But please be patient as it takes a couple months to process and send out all of these certificates. As I mentioned, this series will consist of four sessions. During our previous session, we provided a general overview of using thermal and LIDAR data from airborne campaigns. And in today's session, we will understand how airborne campaigns monitor terrestrial systems. I'll quickly cover our learning objectives for this training. By the end of this training, attendees will be able to understand the applications of hyperspectral data, multispectral data, and LIDAR data for biodiversity monitoring and analysis, and compare case studies that have used these data sets in preparation for upcoming NASA satellite missions and airborne campaigns. After the lecture portion of the session, we will have time for a question and answer portion, so please feel free to type your questions into the questions tab along the way, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. And if we don't get to a question, you can also email me or my colleagues at our addresses listed on the previous slide. For our agenda today, we will start with Atticus Duvall, who will tell us about capturing the structural component of wetland biodiversity. Then Phil Townsend will explain assessing biodiversity with plant functional traits. We will then wrap up this session with some questions and answers. Again, feel free to type your questions into the questions tab along the way, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. So now I'd like to hand it over to our guest speaker, Atticus Duvall, who is part of the University of Maryland and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He'll be providing us with some information about capturing the structural component of wetland biodiversity with airborne LIDAR. All right, thanks so much, Brittany. Um, my name is uh, Atticus Stovall. I'm an assistant research professor at University of Maryland, and I sit at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing, looking at understanding the structural component of wetland biodiversity. And we're doing this through measurements with airborne laser scanning or LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging. So the first question that we really need to consider in this talk is how do we actually measure biodiversity? Uh, the way in which we measure things is extremely important. So having a consistent way to describe and represent something as complex as biodiversity is extremely important. So luckily, through international efforts in the scientific community like GEOBON, or the Group of Earth Observations of Biodiversity Observation Network, there have been some really clear definitions put forward for the scientific community on how we measure and define what biodiversity is. And these variables that we're actually using to quantify biodiversity 
We call them essential biodiversity variables. Essential biodiversity variables were suggested and put forth by Geobon to really provide a framework for scientists to consistently describe different aspects of biodiversity across a number of different systems. The ideal essential biodiversity variable has several components. It needs to capture the critical scales and dimensions of biodiversity. It needs to be a biological variable as well as a state variable. It also needs to be sensitive to change and be agnostic to many different types of ecosystems. And finally, it needs to be actually measurable or technically feasible to measure and economically viable to measure these things through time. So in other words, it needs to be able to be easily measured without being too expensive. So here on the right, you can see a nice diagram of how remote sensing actually plays into our measurements of essential biodiversity variables. On the bottom and the smallest circle, we can see the primary observations of biodiversity, which are captured using either in situ monitoring, plot data, or remote sensing, which we'll mostly be focusing on today. So these two different ways of measuring biodiversity in, in ecosystems uh, helps really to inform our understanding of how biodiversity variables vary through space and time. Now, one of the most critical categories of essential biodiversity variables has to do with ecosystem function. The function of the ecosystem has to do with the performance of these ecosystems and how the organisms in it really respond to different changes in the environment. Within this category, there are three important essential biodiversity variables. They include primary productivity, ecosystem phenology, and ecosystem disturbance. All of these different dimensions of biodiversity variables help us understand how the environment impacts an ecosystem and how ecosystems respond to that. But for today, we're gonna to be focused very heavily on ecosystem structure. Uh, ecosystem structure is a category of essential biodiversity variable that describes the spatial arrangement or uh, spatial arrangement of ecosystem units in an ecosystem. Basically, these units are made up of the organisms that live in these different environments. So the structural variables used as essential biodiversity variables include uh, live cover fraction, which is basically the living fraction of area covered by organisms in an ecosystem. It also includes ecosystem distribution, which tells us the extent of similar ecosystem units, and ecosystem vertical profile, which we'll be talking about a lot today. Ecosystem vertical profile describes the distribution of biomass and ecosystems, but it can also be described by the distribution of foliage, which will be the primary way that we'll represent this variable in today's talk. So on the right, we can see two contrasting wetland ecosystems. At the top, we have a black ash wetland in Minnesota in the United States. In contrast, on the bottom, we have a 50 meter tall mangrove forest in Gabon that we'll actually be talking about today. But here, comparing these two ecosystems, we can really see how the two have very different vertical profiles and structure. So for today's talk, we'll be focusing on wetlands in three distinct ecosystems around the world. The first case study will take place in Wax Lake Delta in Louisiana, in the Gulf of Mexico, United States. Here, we'll be using hyperspectral data and airborne laser scanning 
to understand the different aspects of ecosystem structure as classified by hyperspectral imaging. The next case study takes place in Mozambique in the Zambezi, Zambezi River Delta. Here we'll be using a higher resolution airborne laser scanning data set to map the distribution of ecosystem structure in terms of canopy height and foliage profiles within a mangrove forest. And then finally, we'll move to the tallest mangrove forest in the world in Pangora National Park, Gabon, where we'll use full waveform airborne LIDAR to understand the structural profiles in this unique mangrove system. <clears throat> so first, we're going to start with our case study in Wax Lake Delta, Louisiana, United States. Here, we can see an airborne image of a portion of Wax Lake Delta. And what's really nice about this image is it gives us an idea of all the different structures we might expect to find in these different kind of vegetation classes in the ecosystem. You can see some of the grasses in the center of this, um, this Delta Island. And on the fringes, we see some of this uh, black willow species, a tree species that uh, we'll be talking about in this case study. But let's first start with how Wax Lake Delta was actually formed. Wax Lake Delta was created after a major flooding event in 1973. So on the left hand side of the slide, you can see imagery prior to the flooding. And on the right hand side of this image, you can see Wax Lake Delta after this flooding event. The contrast really is dramatic. A significant amount of land area was created by this deposition of sediment after this flood event. Wax Lake Delta is also the focal site for the Delta X field campaign led by PI Mark Samard. In this mission, UAV-SAR, which is an L-band synthetic aperture radar sensor, and AVRIS-NG, which is a hyperspectral imager, are combined to create a map of ecosystem structure and species assemblage classification. So really, as you can see on this map on the right, the different colors here re represent different clusters of ecosystem types in this delta. And uh, it's all from this hyperspectral data classification. The red box you're seeing right here is our little small subset study area that we're going to focus on in our case study today. So if we zoom into that, we can see uh, some airborne LIDAR data that exists over this area in Wax Lake Delta. In this airborne LIDAR data, you can get uh, the detail of the different structures of these, uh, these different vegetation classifications, which are overlaid on top of the 3D data um, in this picture on the slide. So the different colors represent the different species classifications from the hyperspectral imager. So we're gonna zoom in even further into this little red box. Here we can really start to see some of the detail that this airborne laser scanning data was able to collect. This first image you're seeing here is colored by reflectance of the laser return intensity, which basically is the brightness of the laser light that reflects off of the vegetation. We can also overlay that vegetation classification before and interestingly, we can see some areas that are, are most likely misclassified by this hyperspectral imaging, in part because they're primarily accounting for the spectral information, but not necessarily accounting for the structural information, which we can actually caption with this airborne LIDAR data. And now I wanted to take us on a trip through this data set so you can really start to appreciate some of the vegetation structures that we're able to capture with 3D data. Here we can see in really incredible detail the types of things that come out 
of this airborne LIDAR data set. We can see the trees on the fringes here, colored in purple and, um, and pink. We can also see some of the grasses on the internal uh, portion of these islands that you know, really highlight the, the strengths of what this airborne laser scanning data can do. Now, with this 3D data, we can start to quantify the differences in ecosystem structure for each of the vegetation classes within the area. On, uh, for this entire delta area, we can see that we've classified it into five different vegetation classes. We have elephant ear, dotted smartweed, grasses, yellow lotus, and black willow. If we focus on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, you can see kind of some of the lowest stature vegetations and how the LiDAR measurements were actually able to reconstruct in fine detail the different structural signatures and profiles of these classes of plants. So for example, we have the yellow lotus on the bottom left, where it has a peak at this extremely low elevation range. In contrast, we have the dotted smartweed grass that extends up to around 1.5 meters in height. In contrast to these lower stature vegetation types, we also have the black willow species, uh, which is this tree species in the delta ecosystem. And we can see from the profile here on the right that it extends to almost 20 meters in height above ground. Really, one of the things that I find most interesting about this structural profile and how it's very informative for what we want to do is that it is a, is a pretty close match to the form and structure of the tree itself. If we compare this picture on the right of the black willow to the structural profile, we can almost imagine what the crown of that tree looks like in the 3D data, and LiDAR is able to provide that information. Now, I also wanted to uh, tie in some of the work that I've just presented to uh, a recently awarded NASA Biodiversity Grant Project um, we're calling BioReach. Uh, it's part of the Bioscape mission that um, you've heard about in this session. And basically the, the idea for this particular project is to take some of the methods that I just presented and apply them to different estuaries in South Africa. And so for the project, the, um, our team has three main goals. Basically they're to map the plant functional types in this area um, and map the essential biodiversity variables across all these different estuaries, and then understand the relationship uh, between the imaging spectroscopy classification, like we saw in this case study, and the structural profiles that we're collecting with uh, airborne uh, LIDAR. The next step in this project that we're going to, to do is basically to determine and kind of more in detail understand the drivers of biodiversity within all these different estuary classes. And then finally, we wanna look forward into the future to understand what type of climate impacts might be occurring in these different estuaries and uh, what we can learn with you know, this higher resolution 3D data with regard to what's happening in the future. So just to sum up, I think we can really see with this you know, relatively small case study how LIDAR can really dramatically improve our understanding of vegetation structure, as well as really improve our ability to improve uh, vegetation classification in these more complex wetland environments. So for our next case study, we're going to move to uh, Mozambique in the Zambezi River Delta.
So the Zambezi River Delta is uh, the outlet of an extremely large watershed encompassing more than a million square kilometers and encompassing uh, eight African countries. This delta has mangroves, which are ecologically and economically very important to the area, in part because they're extremely high carbon density and biodiversity. They also serve as an important buffer that protects coastal communities in the area. And really together, all of these factors make this ecosystem an important one for mitigating climate change, reducing coastline loss, and importantly, protecting biodiversity. So within the same area, we also have access to a high resolution airborne LIDAR campaign that was flown in 2014. The year prior to that, field data was collected on the ground for around 140 different plot locations where uh, surveyors went and measured compositional information of the forest and forest structure measurements, which means measurements of tree diameter and height of trees. One of the really amazing things about having uh, these data is that high resolution airborne LIDAR is really exceptionally rare in mangrove e ecosystems. So it presents a really excellent opportunity to understand structural profiles and mangroves in this particular type of ecosystem. So when we use airborne LIDAR data, to map forest structure, one of the things we often need are maps of forest height. So we create what are called canopy height models. These models provide a wall-to-wall -wall map of height of the forest in extremely high resolution, often around one to five meter resolution. So to create a canopy height model, we first need to read in LiDAR data into whatever coding language we're actually working with. I, I mostly personally use the R coding language, but once we have it in there and can actually work with the LiDAR data, the first ta task is really to identify the points in the LiDAR that are considered to be the ground and merge all of these ground elevation points into a continuous surface model that represents in high resolution the terrain of the area that was surveyed. The next step is to identify the point uh, or the points at the top of the canopy in the forest. We need to understand where the top and highest elevation of the forest actually is to create these canopy height models. Once we identify these points, we can similarly just merge those points into a higher resolution model of the top of the canopy. And then actually with some relatively simple math, we subtract out the terrain from the canopy elevation model. And what we're left with is a high resolution map of forest heights. So this type of processing uh, is very applicable for a lot of things and forest height and biomass for instance are uh, considered directly to be essential biodiversity variables so in the context of biodiversity mapping it's pretty easy to see how this is relevant now we're going to take just a quick fly through of uh, this data set and canopy height model that we created here you can really see a lot of the detail that we're actually capturing. This is a one meter canopy height model. And so we're getting a lot of the different textures at the top of the canopy. All of this can be used to create continuous biomass maps that are high precision and give us another map of uh, an essential biodiversity variable that we need. But for today, I wanted to understand a little bit more about what was going on beneath that canopy. I think that's one of the interesting pieces of what we can learn from LiDAR data that is often relatively unexplored and is kind of on the, the cutting edge of what we need to do to understand uh, 
aspects of forest structure that are relevant for biodiversity. So here you can see a similar type of processing that was conducted at our previous site, but instead here we're converting those structural profiles measured with the LIDAR data into estimates of the density of foliage in the forest canopy. We're basically able to do this by using some basic assumptions about how light moves through plant canopies. In the set of figures on the left, we can see each one of the sites, each with several different subplot structural profiles. And what we've do, done is we've ordered these structural profiles by lowest height to tallest height. And what we can see really is that different sites have very different structural profiles, depending really strongly on the height of the forest. What I also think is interesting about this is that based on the height of the forest alone, sometimes uh, you are unable to know with perfect clarity what to expect within that forest. So there really is an amazing amount of utility in having this three-dimensional data that basically passes through the forest canopy and tells you something about what's hidden beneath the canopy. So in general, what we found was that there are around six height-dependent mangrove structural signatures. In this mangrove forest, again, we can see very clearly how mangrove forest structure changes with respect to changing forest heights. But also what's kind of interesting about this is that it gives us another way of seeing how the mangrove ecosystem really changes kind of through time and development um, as a stand, as a forest. We really find that the forest goes from a low and dense canopy, which we would expect to either open or closed canopy tall forest with all these different kind of structural profiles that are characteristic of what we actually see if we go into that forest and walk around and look, um, look to see what the structure is. So to summarize this case study, we really found that LIDAR is also a really important technology that helps us understand how mangrove ecosystem structure changes with respect to height. So finally, for our last case study, I want to move to Pangara National Park in Gabon. So the Gabonese mangroves in Pangara National Park are the tallest in the world. Uh, a study by Samard et al. in 2019 found that the mangroves in this forest reach as tall as 60 meters above ground. The structure of this type of forest is really of particular interest to our research group and many other ecologists and conservation scientists because it offers this really unique perspective on how mangrove structure evolves and develops in extremely tall forests such as this. Now, I'd like to show you a 3D fly through of this extremely rare type of mangrove forest. This three dimensional data was created using the TandemX satellite, which is a, a type of Poland SAR technology. It allows us to create 10 meter canopy height models in mangrove forests globally that look very similar to the LIDAR data that we saw. Uh, in a few slides past. The true color imagery overlaid on top of this is from the Sentinel image that we saw at the beginning of this, uh, this case study section. But really what we're getting from this is uh, hopefully an understanding of the kind of detail that we can get and just how interesting and amazing these tall mangrove forests are. So in 2017, we visited uh, this really rare mangrove forest to study forest structure for the AFRASAR field campaign. Here on the left is Lola Fatiimbo, the PI on the project. And here she's measuring the height of the mangrove trees in this forest. The field work in this area was, there's really no other way to put it, extreme. And it took a lot of effort 
but it really was an experience that I'll never forget. Here's a picture of a few of the sites that I was, uh, I was able to visit while doing field work there. This is some of our crew when we were out in the field. And uh, I think one of the, the things we can see clearly from this is uh, doing field work in mangroves is, is dirty work, but it's really rewarding. And there's really no other forest like this. So if anyone has the opportunity to visit mangroves like this, definitely do it. But one of the things I wanted to show, just to kind of give you a sense of scale, is that when we were there, uh, one of the things that I was doing was I was collecting three-dimensional laser scanning data from the ground. So what you're seeing here is not actually a photograph. This is an infrared three-dimensional image captured with high-resolution ground-based laser scanning data. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the bottom right of the screen, there's a person standing on the roots of a gigantic mangrove tree. These trees reached nearly 60 meters in height, and often we were unable to reach the place where we were supposed to measure tree diameter, which was several meters above this person's head. So uh, just to give you a sense of scale of the type of mangroves we're dealing with here, really there's nothing else like this in the world. So a very unique opportunity, a place, to, um, a place to explore and understand more about. In 2016, prior to us visiting Pangara, Elvis, uh, the Land Vegetation Ice Sensor, which is one of NASA's airborne LIDAR instruments, flew several sites in Gabon for the AFRASAR airborne campaign. One of these sites was Pungara National Park. Uh, if you're curious about any of the details uh, uh, and specifications of the flight, you can see them in this table on the left. Um, but ultimately, what we want to do with this full waveform LIDAR data is to analyze and understand structure in this rare and really special tall mangrove forest. And here's just uh, a few of the flight lines that went over Pungara National Park so you can get an idea of the coverage we had from the Elvis sensor. So after looking at the Elvis data, we found that in low and medium stature forests, which we define as zero to 10 meters and 10 to 30 meter size classes, we had around three different structural signatures per class. So on the left, you can see the lowest size class up to 10 meters and how the structural signature really varies with the distribution of the location of the kind of high density foliage uh, in the stand. In the mid-stature forest, we also find that there are around three different structural signatures that, uh, that were in this forest. We have two with higher understory density and one that actually has open understory and high density canopy foliage. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can really see the stark contrast between these two different size classes and how that changes the structure of this mangrove forest. So at the top, we have a two meter stand, which most likely corresponds to this, uh, this structural profile in blue on the left hand um, pane. And on the bottom picture, we have what is most likely uh, corresponding to the red structural profile in the right hand pane. But what's interesting about this is that with the LIDAR data, we're actually able to detect these different structural signatures and see how they relate to height in this different, um, in this really cool mangrove forest. Finally, if we start looking in the tallest mangrove stands, for this, we're talking about stands greater than 30 meters in canopy height which in terms of rarity in the global distribution 
of mangrove uh, mangrove heights, we're talking about the 95th to 99th to 100th percentile of height um, distribution in the entire world. So understanding what's happening between 30 meters and 60 meters in canopy height is really, really uh, a unique opportunity that we can only do in this type of mangrove stand. And what we found was really interesting. We found five different unique structural signatures for these tall mangrove forests. Each of these structural signatures was strongly influenced by the location of the peak of the understory or the canopy foliage density. Some had high understory density and all others really had a very open understory and high density in the canopy. The picture on the right, um, we can kind of classify, I would say, as a type two structure. Um, so the second pane in these figures, which corresponds to high canopy density and open understory. And you know, this type of structural classification will ultimately be super valuable for us to understand actually how these forest wetlands function. And so it's amazing that we have this uh, data to be able to tease this information out. Now, finally, I wanted to end this section showing you some of that high resolution three-dimensional data that we collected on the ground in Pungara National Park. This three-dimensional data was collected with our terrestrial laser scanner, and really it shows the incredible high-resolution detail. You can see me sitting on a mangrove root right there in this, uh, in this three-dimensional data. So it's able to capture leaf-level detail and all the you know, kind of complexity of the root structures and the trunk. And, and the foliage profiles, all of which we're using to improve our understanding and estimates of biodiversity and uh, structural uh, diversity in this system. So to summarize this uh, case study, in this tall mangrove forest, LIDAR was able to improve the classification of our ecosystem structural signature and improve our understanding of structural diversity in general. So if we consider everything that we just discussed in this talk, it becomes really clear that we can characterize the fine scale structure of ecosystems in really amazing detail. And what's really, uh, really interesting, I think, is that LIDAR can really precisely estimate what, you know, what we all kind of need in the biodiversity mapping community, these essential biodiversity variables. But I would argue that it actually takes, uh, it takes us to a step further than that because now it's allowing us to pull out information that we previously didn't easily have access to and might actually allow us to systematically uh, have available new types of essential biodiversity variables that we have not really yet defined um, in the context of the EBVs defined by GeoBond. And now what's really cool is that LIDAR is actually avail available globally with the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, or JEDI. Um, and what's amazing about this mission is it actually enables global scale mapping of wetland structure and function. So all the things that I presented today, showing you the structural profile, showing you canopy height estimates, JEDI can either directly measure or improve our estimates of this. And our group is actually already using uh, this data set, the JEDI data, to create global mangrove height and biomass maps. Just to give you kind of a taste of some of the things that we can do, if we merge our high resolution height estimates of uh, collected with tandem X data with JEDI, we can start to get really um, amazing detail and estimates 
of both canopy height in mangroves as well as biomass. And ultimately, this will really help us be able to understand the structural signature of mangrove forests as well as many other wetland, um, wetland ecosystems around the world. So what I'll say is this map is uh, hopefully going to be out relatively soon. And so uh, stay tuned for uh, that coming publication. The last thing I wanted to say is that uh, this, you know, all this work is really a group effort. This is uh, the Lola Lab, uh, <laughs> led by Lola Fatiembo. We're all members here, and uh, I just want to thank everyone who's involved with um, all the different aspects of this work with mangroves and other other ecosystems, um, wetland ecosystems. So thank you to them, and thank you to everyone here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that with us, Atticus. And now we'll hear from Phil Townsend from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He will tell us about accessing biodiversity with plant functional traits, using hyperspectral visible to shortwave infrared imaging, spectroscopy data, and LIDAR data. Thank you, Brittany. I'm looking forward today to talking to you about the use of airborne hyperspectral imagery for biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. Hyperspectral imagery refers to something that we call imaging spectroscopy. Spectroscopy has long been used for the study of vegetation. In the case that you see here on these figures from studies that go back almost a century, we know that the reflectance of vegetation changes across different wavelengths shown here on the x-axis. So for example, this hump that we see here at 550 nanometers, those are at the green wavelengths, which explains to us in part why vegetation is green. So different types of vegetation, vegetation at different stages of development and age may all have different reflectance values that we can use to understand something about the functioning of those plants. Reflectance spectroscopy has widely been used now over recent, uh, over recent decades to understand the biochemistry of plants, which we can use to understand the functioning of those plants. So this figure here, again, showing the reflectance of three different leaves from a violet, a maple, and from rye, shows you differences in reflectance that we would see across these wavelengths. The wavelengths that are shown here are 400 to 2500 nanometers, which encompasses the visible wavelengths, 400 to 700, which we saw in the last slide, the near infrared, which is 700 to about 1300, shown here with this large hump where vegetation tends to reflect a lot of light, and the shortwave infrared, which goes out to 2,500 nanometers. And you'll notice that there are various different locations in the spectrum of these different plants uh, where, there is a, where there are absorption or reflectance features associated with the different types of chemistries in the plants. So again, I'll point you to um, the blue and red wavelengths here where chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A are absorbed um, and uh, which are where light is absorbed for use in photosynthesis. And then some of these other uh, uh, more, more complex um, molecules that have absorption features in longer wavelengths. So you'll see that nitrogen is here, and this is nitrogen as part of, for example, uh, proteins. And we're actually looking at very small features. So I'm going to point you to this feature right here of phenolics that's at about 1660 nanometers. And you'll see that there's this little dip in the orange line and that's maples. And that's an absorption feature associated with phenolics, which are defensive compounds of plants. And uh, maples are, tend to be very high in phenolics in these defensive compounds. And so these very small features that we see in the spectrum of plants can be used to get a lot of information that, um, that we might otherwise have to use complex and, and, uh, and, time, and um, complex, expensive, and time-consuming laboratory chemistry to do. <clears throat> 
imaging spectroscopy then is where every pixel in an image is actually a spectrum. And it's very hard to illustrate this. So I'm just going to show you three images. Actually, these are all the same three images that come from a hyperspectral sensor in which hundreds and hundreds of wavelengths are measured. And the top figure shows a true color image like we would see with our eyes. Uh, a traditional false color infrared image is in the middle. This is where the near infrared, where vegetation reflects a lot of light, is shown in the uh, red channel. And then finally at the bottom is a, um, is a multivariate rendering of all of the hyperspectral information content. And what you can see is that there's an incredible amount of information across the hundreds of wavelengths that are represented in this image. And uh, a good way to visualize this, again, is to look at um, some more spectra. In the upper left of your figure, you'll see spectra of, of various different vegetation types, as well as non-photosynthetic vegetation, so things like uh, senesc leaves and, and grasses and branches. And you'll see that information in a spectrum is collected all along there. Right below that, you see a solar irradiance spectrum, and you'll see all of these narrow lines. Those are all of the wavelengths at which the spectrum is measured and which we have a band or a channel in the image. So hundreds and hundreds of bands of data. If you contrast that to the more traditional imagery we might see, say a photograph shown here in the upper right with the red box around it, that's just going to be measuring in the red, green, and the blue, or if you look at something like Landsat or, um, or MODIS or Sentinel imagery, there are just broad spectral bands that get measured by those different sensors. And so there's a lot of information compared to a much lower amount of information. Therefore, the detection of these different features can be uh, such as cellulose lignin sugar, sugars, nitrogen phenolics, and so forth such that we can detect them in a way that we can't when you're measuring broad bands, such as using a, a multispectral se sensor or even a camera. And so the way that we tend to visualize hyperspectral imagery is as an image cube. So here you just see a true color image, and then you see all of these colors along here represent all of the different wavelengths and different bands that are measured. And there's a stylized spectrum shown here that just basically shows you where all of these different wavelengths lie. For more than three decades, people have been using airborne um, airplane instruments, uh, have been using hyperspectral instruments on board airplanes uh, to, to make uh, hyperspectral measurements. And shown here on the right are a number of different systems, such as the Global Airborne Observatory out of Arizona State University. Uh, NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, has an airborne uh, observatory network that they fly over NEON sites. High Specs is a, um, a commercial manufacturer of instruments. And then NASA flies uh, its Avarice sensors on various different airplanes. And we, we realized that we could actually make maps of vegetation traits, for example, from hyperspectral imagery quite some time ago. The first paper that showed that we could do this was from Carol Westman at al. Um, from back in uh, 1988, where they showed that we could measure lignin concentration. So this is these are structural compounds in plant leaves that are generally used um, by plants uh, in support of their hydraulics, uh, as well as nitrogen. So how can we use this information from hyperspectral imagery? Well, there are lots of different um, uh, applications that we can have for this. I already hinted at it a little bit in that there's uh, information about the chemistry of plants that we can use to infer processes that are going on in ecosystems. So we basically have questions, for example, how does the nitrogen content or chlorophyll content or other traits of plants affect its ability to take up carbon? What is the variation among different plant species and the roles they play in an ecosystem? So we can ask a question like that, collect data in the field, model the spectral model, uh, model how the spectra relates to these traits, and then make maps of these traits to be able to understand ecosystems at broad scales. I like to think of it this way. 
in an ecosystem, there are various different things that we can measure and see. So for example, photosynthesis is the uptake of car carbon. This leads to growth in plants, which can then create a different structure in the ecosystem. And there are various different things that the plant is doing all throughout this. It could be growth or reproduction, respiration, and defense against, say, herbivores, insects, and so forth. And these different processes that are going on in an ecosystem are all things that are, 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 can be challenging to actually measure in the field. So to ask questions at the scale of remote sensing at landscape and larger scales requires um, data that enables us to measure these different components. So now we can add these different characteristics that we can detect from hyperspectral imagery, such as mapping chlorophylls and nitrogen content, uh, which are certainly related to harvesting of light by plants and nitrogen as the main uh, component of rubisco, which is what, um, what uh, facilitates the uptake of carbon uh, in the Calvin cycle. As well, we can measure non-structural carbohydrates. So non-structural carbohydrates or NSCs are the initial outputs of photosynthesis, sugars and starches that get used to build everything else. So over here on the right side of the screen, you'll see lignin and cellulose, phenolics and tannins. Those all start out as non-structural carbohydrates and all of those are detectable from hyperspectral imagery. The top um, uh, trait in gray, so we call these plant traits, the, the, uh, the, the words that are in the gray boxes, is LMA or leaf mass per area. That's not actually, that is a trait, it's not actually a compound of a leaf, but it is actually a descriptor basically of the thickness of a leaf, and it's one of the things that we can best detect using hyperspectral remote sensing. So I'm going to talk about how we can use these methods uh, um, to analyze hyperspectral imagery to look at how plant functional traits uh, change across different types of biomes and different types of ecosystems. We can look at how plants change their strategies um, phenologically, so over the course of a growing season. We can use it to understand how plants respond to environmental change. And ultimately, we see this as providing a framework for being able to use the next generation of satellites that have hyperspectral sensors to uh, study all of these things at global scales. These global scale hyperspectral satellites don't yet exist, but should in the next five to 10 years. So I'll just provide a brief overview here of how we analyze the data, but really I'd rather spend more of the time talking about what we learn from the data when we analyze it. Hyperspectral imagery from airborne sensors requires quite a bit of pre-processing. Uh, first of all, there will be um, atmospheric correction, so correcting the effects of the atmosphere so that what we see is the surface reflectance. Then there's a whole bunch of different types of corrections for the presence of clouds and shadows, for uh, topography so that different sides of a slope that are illuminated differently by the sun have, uh, have similar reflectances. BRDF correction handles differences um, that you might see from one side of a scene to another, again, because of the changing direction of the sun or exposure to the sun, and a variety of other different factors. In addition, we have to collect data out in the field um, related to those traits, then scale them up to the size of a pixel, and then build models to then predict all of these different traits. And here's just an example of some of them. LMA, which is leaf mass per area. Uh, the higher your LMA, the thicker your leaves are, the slower your photosynthesis is, for example. Nitrogen, cellulose, lignin, non-structural carbohydrates, phenolics, and so forth. To look at the diversity of functional traits from hyperspectral imagery across ecosystems, I'm going to use NEON as an example. Now, at all of these NEON sites, they fly hyperspectral imagery at least every year, or just about every year, um, usually four out of every five years. Um, and so these sites get monitored frequently, and they're meant to represent the range of ecoclimatic variation across uh, the United States. Uh, in my group, we've gone out and we've actually sampled in all of these ecosystems. So it's, there are 20 domains, and we've sampled in 19 of the 20 domains. 
Um, and uh, we go out and we collect uh, vegetation samples, we take them back to the lab, we analyze them for the chemistry, and then we link them to the imagery to be able to build uh, the models to make the maps. And it's the maps that we really want to see. So this is just a selection of, um, of uh, maps of traits from across uh, a variety of the different neon domains, everything from Harvard Forest in your upper left to uh, Tulip Lake in Alaska, uh, on your lower right and other sites such as Niwot Ridge uh, in the middle of the bottom row, that's in Colorado, um, Kanza Prairie in Kansas, and, um, and uh, the Smithsonian uh, Reserve in Maryland uh, in the middle domain two there. And all of these graphs are showing the same three traits, chlorophyll, which is related to, to light harvesting, LMA or leaf mass per area, which is essentially leaf thickness. Higher LMA means uh, more investment in leaf structure. Lower LMA means thinner, larger leaves that invest more in faster photosynthesis. And then phenolics, which are defensive compounds. And here, what you can see from this figure is the great diversity of ecosystem function that you'll see across all of these different sites. And we, uh, hyperspectral imagery will allow us to, uh, to, to track this through time and to do comparisons between different ecosystems. So for example, an ecosystem that might invest more in, uh, in defensive compounds such as phenolics might be shown in the redder tones uh, represents a trade-off with an ecosystem that might invest more in faster photosynthesis, which might be the greener colors that you would see. And also in that graphic, you would have also seen the, very, the ranges in diversity across those ecosystems. And why this is important is because plant traits, which would be shown in the uh, third figure uh, on, this, uh, on this graph that we see right here, plant traits give you a lot more information about ecosystems than the traditional land cover type uh, classification. So this is uh, an area of the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, showing you uh, land cover, traditional land cover type maps, then a uh, physiology based map, which comes from the traits and then plant structure, which is coming from LIDAR data such as Atticus would have talked to you about. So that gives you a sense of what we can do in terms of looking at the diversity of ecosystems uh, uh, across space. Now let's think about how those ecosystems change in time. And so first we're going to start with looking at phenological time. And these are just uh, shots of hyperspectral images over uh, a forest and a grassland area in Wisconsin. Um, going through the course of the growing season. And you can certainly look at these images and see changes that are occurring, but we can actually also map how those, those traits and how the diversity of those traits might change over the course of a growing season. So I'm gonna show you now um, some figures from a different site, also uh, in which we measured the phenological uh, uh, trajectory using hyperspectral imagery. This is a nearby site that's called Blackhawk Island. It's that site that I showed you on one of those first slides where the first maps of foliar chemistry were made back in the 1980s. It's a place where in recent years, we've gone back and done some repeat imaging um, uh, because of some of the significance of the site. At this site, we have collected hyperspectral imagery and mapped and collected traits data and also mapped all of the species composition. And so now I want to show you how traits change over the course of a growing season. I'm going to show it for six representative species that we see on the island. In this case, we're going to see LMA and phenolics again. And this time, instead of chl chlorophyll, we're seeing um, potassium. And I want to draw your attention here to these dots on this triangle. So this triangle is showing you that blue means more potassium, green means more leaf mass per area, and uh, red means more phenolic. So you would interpret your graph as these different species investing more. And you're going to see those dots change as the trajectory through the growing season changes. And it'll also be plotted for each one of them on the right. So we can actually now start to look at how these different um, species change and how they respond 
So I'm going to go ahead and uh, run the animation again so you can see it. And there, you, there you see the uh, different species becoming more distinct from each other as the growing season uh, progresses. So what you could see from this is that each of these different species actually occupy a different trait niche space. So they have different characteristics which allow them, uh, which enable them to, uh, to uh, coexist and also take advantage of different components of, of the ecosystem and the resources. And I'll just draw your attention here, for example, to phenolics. Again, here you see this Acer rubrum, it's the blue species, has much higher phenolics than any of the other species. You'll also note that it increases in phenolics over the course of the growing season, whereas the other five species that are shown there actually decrease in phenolics. They start out at the beginning of the growing season with high levels of phenolics, and at the beginning of the growing season, when young leaves come out, they, they're very tasty, and that's when herbivores or insects want to come and um, and uh, and, uh, uh, and and defoliate or eat the leaves, and um, it, it's in the plant's best interest to have higher amounts of defensive compounds with those young, tender leaves. As the leaves grow older, there becomes less of a need for phenolics in in these because the leaf mass per area, shown here on the top, actually increases. As leaves get thicker, they become less palatable. Maples, on the other hand, the leaves also increase in LMA, but because, uh, because of their own evolutionary status, they have a tendency to actually increase over the course of the season and use phenolics as their primary defense mechanism. And so we can see how these different species sort out and uh, the different traits that they have and understand the differences in the ecosystem. Now I'd like to talk about uh, using hyperspectral imagery across years. So we just looked at hyperspectral imagery within a year and what it told us about different strategies by different species. Now we want to look at how whole ecosystems change over the course of time. And in this case, I'm gonna use the example of the California mega drought. So this is a Mediterranean ecosystem uh, there in California, where from 2012 to 2018, there was an unprecedented drought um, and this graphic here that you see from Drought Monitor shows the percent of the area in California in drought. And you can see it starts to pick up in 2012, then in 2014, into 2015 and 16, um, the drought was very extensive. Uh, and uh, a wet winter in 2017, going into 2017, uh, allowed the drought to dissipate somewhat before it picked back up again. Uh, in the early part of this decade, although with all the rainfall California has received this winter, the drought will be severely um, uh, compromised uh, in, in a good way. And uh, the, the, the drought and the effect of the drought on the vegetation of California has received a, a, lot, of, uh, a, a lot of news coverage or received a lot of new, news coverage. Um, due to the mortality of trees in particular from increased bark beetle temperature, um, uh, ch uh, changes in availability of water and trees inability to be able to, uh, to, to, to move the water from the soil to the tops of the trees uh, and, and so forth. And so we thought uh, with our work with hyperspectral imagery, we would see if traits themselves, of the traits of the plants themselves, had any explanation for the response to the drought. And so for this, I'm going to use um, a, a study that used NASA's Avarice Classic sensor, which is a hyperspectral sensor that's flown on a, an ER-2 airplane. And I'm gonna show you results from this white box here, um, which is uh, called the Southern Sierras or Yosemite box. It includes Yosemite National Park and the southern part of the Sierras, uh, which is where a lot of the mortality that we saw occurred. And later, I'll show you just one little slide uh, from this area of Southern California that's near Santa Barbara uh, to illustrate another example of how we can use hyperspectral imagery. Okay, so let's look at the hyperspectral imagery that was acquired for the uh, Southern Sierras box. 
So you can imagine that we could go out and collect these, these images and we could look at them across these different years in which the drought occurred starting in 2013 and going through 2018. And we can make a traditional false color composite image. And this is actually the image from each one of these different years. And if you look at them, eh, there's not really too much that we see just looking at the images. Although maybe if you look at uh, 2017 here, you can see uh, uh, the vast increase in snow. These images are all from early June of the year. So looking at these images then, we want to go and actually use our methods to map the traits. And here are the maps of the traits and you can immediately look at this and see that there are some pretty significant differences. So in this case now, I am showing you leaf mass per area and nitrogen. So those are the two main dimensions that uh, describe photosynthetic capacity. More LMA means less investment in photosynthesis. Higher nitrogen means greater investment in photosynthesis. Non-structural carbohydrates are the third one. And this is really interesting because non-structural carbohydrates are the immediate outputs of photosynthesis. The sugars and starches that are created uh, as a consequence of, of the photosynthetic activity. And generally, uh, higher non-structural carbohydrates means that the plants are holding those non-structural carbohydrates, so sugars and starches in reserve. If a plant feels really confident in what's going on around it, that plant is actually going to convert the non-structural carbohydrates into wood, into cellulose, into phenolics, defensive compounds, and so forth. And so what you see here, if you look at the, the, the data, is that there is this movement towards more investment in non-structural non carbohydrates through time. I'm gonna just explain this figure to you a little bit here. We're looking at 2013, we're looking at nitrogen in the blue, so areas that are more blue, like these agricultural areas to the southwest have higher nitrogen, that's what would be expected from agriculture. And the areas that are redder, which you might see through the main portion of it, have higher investment in leaf structure. We did a principal components analysis on this data from 2013 to be able to show the distribution of these different traits across ecosystems. And we're going to use this, this uh, principal components analysis in each subsequent year to see how plants in this whole area change their allocation of resources. So we can move to 2014 and you see the, the, the drought had started, but it hadn't gotten to its peak uh, um, um, condition yet, which it did in 2015. And here I'll really note that you'll see that the whole scene becomes a whole lot more yellow. It means that there's a lot more investment by the plants in non-structural carbohydrates rather than some of the other elements related to photosynthesis. You'll look now at the, at the, the PCA diagram here and you'll see that the center of the, uh, uh, the bullet of the center of the data points is actually moved towards non-structural carbohydrates. And this shows that the whole ecosystem has changed its profile of traits through time. Then we had a wet winter going into 2017 and the vegetation responded, it improved, it came back closer to where it was when it started, but not all the way, which you can see here, the bullseye has moved away from non-structural carbohydrates, but not back to the center that we see uh, of the diagram. That would likely take several more years before the vegetation is fully recovered. And we can go then and um, we can observe this in an animation. So this is the same figure and this is just showing how through time uh, the vegetation trait allocation has changed as a consequence of response to the drought. All of these images come from the same time of year. All of this data comes from the hyperspectral imagery that you saw. And what's interesting about this is that if you look at this diagram here on the left, this is showing the relationship between phenolics, defensive compounds, and non-structural carbohydrates, um, which are the initial outputs of photosynthesis. And you'll see that in general, those are positively correlated with each other. So when times uh, when there are plenty of non-structural carbohydrates, the plants will also invest in phenolics. However, if we look at the drought now, so this is at the national scale on the left coming from NEON data. If we look at what happened during the drought, non-structural carbohydrates increased as shown here for 2015 and 2016 in these ridge plots, the red and the green years, 
whereas phenolics actually derived from the hyperspectral imagery actually decline over the course of the drought. So during the drought, the plants make a different decision than they might normally, than you might normally see in terms of these relationships, that during the drought, plants will retain a lot of the outputs of photosynthesis at non-structural carbohydrates and invest less in phenolics. Where else can we use hyperspectral imagery? So I've tried to make the point that what we're seeing in these data are, um, are uh, allocation of resources that, uh, that, plants, that plants make. And if we take data from a whole range of species, blue being native species and orange being invasive species, you'll see that we can, in this, this principal components diagram, again, the same thing, a different set of traits, some of the same traits and a few different traits, you'll see that orange or invasive species fill a particular niche in the whole space uh, occupied by all of the species. So the blue dots represent species that are native, the orange dots are species that are invasive, and you'll see that the invasive species tend to fill a trait space that is much smaller, and if you look at the direction of the arrows, nitrogen, potassium, chlorophyll, traits that are associated with fast photosynthetic rates tend to be in the fast growing area. So we might be able to use this sort of information to actually be able to identify invasive species, which are a major issue in many ecosystem types, but in particular in Mediterranean ecosystem types. So this is where I'm gonna just show you another example from, uh, from a different uh, um, area of flights uh, in California. Uh, near Santa Barbara. This is a uh, um, point conception uh, here where basically we have the boundary between Southern California and Northern California. And here we're showing leaf mass per area, leaf water content, and nitrogen from an image that was uh, at the beginning of the growing season when things are pretty green actually at this point in California from uh, February 28th of last year. And you'll see that there's a whole range of variation but I'll point you in particular to this area right here at the point where you see it's actually very, very different. The color is yellow. And if you look back at the different colors that we have for leaf mass per area, leaf water content, and nitrogen, if you actually mix all of those together, it actually makes this yellow color. So this is an area that is high in nitrogen, high in water, and high in leaf mass per area, which is not a common combination and would be a very effective strategy. Well, this is an area that's dominated by ice plant, which in California is a very invasive species and is very much of concern in these sensitive uh, ecosystems. So this shows an example of where we're able to use this trade-based mapping from hyperspectral imagery to identify sort of hotspots on the landscape that look different, that might show different types of, um, uh, of trait uh, allocations that that might be of concern. Another place where we can use hyperspectral imagery is to look at um, how, uh, how traits affect carbon dynamics. So I've talked about how some of these traits, such as leaf mass per area and nitrogen, are very strongly related to carbon uptake. And what I'm showing you here are the locations of four different uh, flux towers. So measuring carbon uptake, measuring net ecosystem, uh, exchange, which can then be used to uh, predict uh, gross primary productivity from across these different sites. And each of these different uh, circular arrows around the flux towers are the footprints um, of the flux tower given a different wind direction. And my only point here is that within each one of these different footprints, you'll see that there's a different distribution of traits and a different diversity of traits that might very well affect the total carbon uptake. And if we look at just this one tower, NW1 here on the left, and you look at these different uh, flux footprints, we can see that the GPP or gross primary productivity is pretty different um, across these different flux uh, footprints, in particular, this NW1, which is the Northwest one here. So very different trait profiles might lead to very different amounts of carbon uptake. And this is uh, also shown by, by a, a more dynamic uh, view of the data, where what we're seeing here is GPP on the blue line across all of these different dates. And then the green line is the amount of nitrogen in the canopy, 
based on what the footprint is across each one of these days. And you can see that they, they track each other pretty well. There are some differences that are probably due to weather and clouds and so forth that might have occurred at different times. But you see that there is a general tracking of, the, uh, of higher GPP with higher nitrogen. This might then be able to give us some insights into differences in carbon uptake and carbon dynamics uh, across landscapes because we can't put flux towers everywhere and it's difficult to measure uh, photosynthesis everywhere as well. So what does the future hold? With hyperspectral imagery, we can map functional traits and functional diversity which will allow us to quantify biodiversity in places where it is hard to measure in situ. That's one of the big take home messages is that we can't go out and measure all of these traits and, at all of these places. And even if we can get to all of these places across the world, especially remote areas of the world, we can't get to everywhere. We can't cover the, the entirety of say, uh, ecological gradients or environmental gradients. So we can use this information to characterize the role of biodiversity in ecosystem functions, such as I showed you on that last graph associated with um, uh, carbon uptake in flux tower footprints. We can also look at how within a year, uh, and uh, not just within a year, but also across years, how traits may change and how these are part of the ecological strategies that plants have in response to change. This also allows us to do things like identify threats to biodiversity um, uh, by finding combinations of traits that might be associated with invasive species. And then ultimately, uh, for me, I'm interested in answering the question, are ecological processes the same across similar ecosystem types or across similar types of environmental gradients, such as temperature or, uh, or altitude gradients? So for example, um, the species are very different in Mediterranean ecosystems of South Africa and California, very different evolutionary histories, but the environments are very similar. So are the responses of species across those environmental gradients and in response to drought or in response to fire, are they similar or not? And uh, once we start to have global imaging spectroscopy from satellites, we'll be able to ask and answer these questions um, uh, at global scales. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil, for providing us with that highlight. To now summarize today's session, LIDAR and hyperspectral data can help us better understand the biodiversity and function of vegetation. Also, LIDAR measurements can assist in the development of canopy height models, which help us better understand forest structure. Here we have a few resources related to those subjects that we discussed in the session today. I encourage you all to use them to learn more about these topics. Thank you for joining us today and do come back on Wednesday for our final session on biodiversity applications for airborne imaging systems. If you have further questions, you can contact myself or my RSET colleagues at our email addresses listed here. As a reminder, here is the course website where you can all find the materials, including the PowerPoint presentation and video. The homework link will be available on the course website during the final session. And I have also included our primary RSET website where you can check out all of our other great trainings. Thank you again. And now we will begin the question and answer portion of the session. Okay. So throughout this training today, we have been adding all of the questions that you've all written in the questions tab, and we've been starting to answer them here on this document that we will be sharing in a second. There it is. Thank you, Sylvan. Um, so I'm joined today by various organizers and panelists for this training series, and we've been answering them all as best we can. I know we only have a couple minutes here at the end, so we'll go through some of the questions now, but we will continue to answer all the questions that come in and post them on uh, the website in a couple of days. Uh, so with that being said, we can just jump into the questions. I'm gonna answer uh, what's written here, but for all of our panelists, if there's any responses you'd like to add, please feel free to unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, your response will also be included here in the answers. All right, so let's start with question one. 
do you know vertical profile metrics obtained from conventional drones? Uh, the answer here is there are more than 100 different statistical metrics that can be derived from ALS and drone LIDAR. All are based on the point cloud structure or variation in modeled surfaces in the LIDAR data. Is there anything that our panelists would like to add? I think I see a couple of you are unmuted, so please feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, so this is Atticus Stovall. Um, I, I can briefly add a little bit more detail to this. Um, so the vertical profile metrics uh, is kind of an active area of research for um, uh, ALS data and especially for drone-based LIDAR. And so uh, I was trying to kind of you know, purposefully leave this as kind of an open-ended uh, response to this question, just in part because drone-based LIDAR applications are uh, still in a pretty experimental phase. Um, and also the fact that, which I alluded to in this question, that we have, you know, uh, well over 100 standard statistical metrics that we will pull out of LIDAR-based point clouds. And so, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to <laughs> go into all of those metrics today. But um, I, I would, you know, strongly encourage uh, people to to read some of the documentation for the LIDAR package that I, I discuss lower down in these uh, the, the Q&A here, because that documentation describes some of these point-based metrics that can be applicable to ALS, so airborne LIDAR, or drone-based LIDAR. All right, great, thank you. Uh, all right, on to question two. I think this is a question about point density. Um, how many points per square meter was the UAV SAR data in the Wax Lake Delta study? And then the answer is the UAV SAR data was radar data, so it doesn't have points per square meter, but the ALS data was about four points per square meters. Is there anything any of our panelists would like to add to that one? This is Atticus again. And um, I, the one thing I wanted to add, just in case this was um, a, a question of, of resolution of the UAV SAR data, I believe it was 10 meter resolution. So um, yeah, no, not a points per square meter, uh, but yeah, the LIDAR was around four. All right, thank you. So on to question three. Uh, for the LIDAR data animation before slide 13, when I download the data, what will I see? I don't think we can see the colored 3D animation that you showed. Also, what does each color represent and how are they assigned? So the answer here says you will see a cloud of points. You can try opening it in Cloud Compare. And the colored data showing classification will require some extra processing steps that require matching the UAV SAR classifications to the ALS point cloud. Before we jump on to question four, is there anything our panelists would like to add? Atticus again here, yeah. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to add here is that uh, depending on what this question was referencing, um, if they were wondering about the canopy height model data that's uh, that's already available or needs to be processed. You won't you won't see that with the raw or um, the lidar data that's directly downloaded from the website. You should uh, I would encourage everyone here to look at a website called Open Topography. 
because they have some really useful uh, out of the box tools that allow you to directly download the canopy height model data that can be a lot easier to work with if you're new to using LIDAR data. All right, on to question four. Uh, the spatial resolution of LIDAR is 0 0.1 degree, which can consist of more than one tree or just be part of a tree in the tropical areas. How do we know if we are seeing more than one tree or just part of a tree to determine the biodiversity? And the answer here is that airborne LIDAR spatial resolution is typically about one meter resolution for canopy height models. So tree crowns are clearly visible. It can be very difficult to isolate individual tree crowns in closed canopy forests, but it is possible with high resolution LIDAR. All right, is there anything we'd like to add here? All right, then we can jump to question five. Why is there a lack of LIDAR specifically in mangrove ecosystems? Our answer here is that it is mostly an understudied ecosystem, probably because it is not a managed forest ecosystem and rarely ALS data is captured because there's very little topography. Would any of our panelists like to add anything uh, for this response? I can add just a little bit extra here. Um, the thing to realize is that often LIDAR data is collected uh, not specifically for scientific purposes. Um, uh, LIDAR data, especially in coastal ecosystems, is collected because uh, you know governments, uh, whether you know in the U.S. state governments or countries, are collecting those data uh, to map top topography and um, unless the those governments have specifically um, you know set aside that funding to uh, to access or sorry to uh, to map that coastal system then it's uh, it's not going to necessarily be available in part because lidar is an expensive um, uh, airborne you know uh, product to to create and collect. So that's a big part of it is that um, unless there is government money often or a specific purpose for collecting that LIDAR data, it just won't be collected. And there are a lot of other places, especially managed forest stands where LIDAR data is much more commonly and regularly collected. All right, uh, so I think for the sake of time, the next question will be our last question today, um, but keep in mind that our panelists have answered all of the questions that you asked here in the questions tab, and they uh, will be available online on our training website afterwards in a couple of days. So I certainly encourage you all to download and read it uh, when it's available. Um, so onto our last question, question six. Is it always possible to find ground points to create a model? Uh, no, sometimes the canopy is extremely dense and the ground is unable to be seen. This happens often in dense tropical forest. Also, it is a problem in wetlands when grasses are extremely dense and the ground has a lot of micro topography that you may want to capture. Is there any uh, anything anyone would like to add here? All right. Uh, well, we are at the end of our time today. So this does mark the end of session three for our biodiversity applications for airborne imaging systems. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for all of our panelists and guest speakers. Um, we hope to see everyone in our final session uh, for this training series, which is this Wednesday, April 5th at 11 a.m. Eastern time.
Uh, other than that, uh, have a great day. And thank you all again for being a part of this session.